Jonathan King 19 and America. Um, I was lucky enough to have been to America when I went around the world, but I'd not spent a lot of time there, even though my father was, as you know, originally from America, and he lived in Britain most of his life. Um, but uh, Everyone's Gone to the Moon, I'm glad to say, turned out to be a big American hit. So I was rushed over there to appear on all the various shows um, and immediately contacted various friends that I'd made over the years. The best of which was probably Derek Taylor. I've mentioned Derek Taylor before. He used to be the Beatles publicist. But he'd given that up and had gone to live in Los Angeles with his wife and kids and had an office in the 9000 building on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, and in fact, my car number plate is JK9000 after that building in memory of Derek Taylor, one of the greatest people in the world. Anyway, Derek was looking after a band as a publicist uh, uh, who were almost the American artists answer to the Beatles and they were called the birds hey Mr Tambourine Man play a song for me and various other ones all I really want to do is baby be friends with you you can see why I became such a big singing star can't you Ah! Anyway, Derek was, uh, a, as you know, a dear friend and, and I met with him and immediately he took me round everywhere. I was high in the charts. Actually, I was number one in Los Angeles when I arrived there. And I was met by Roger Gordon, who was the London Records promotion man in Los Angeles. And I was taken to my hotel, which was then the hotel that everybody stayed in, which was the Gene Autry's Continental on Sunset Strip. I think it's now the Hyatt. It may even be something else. Anyway, we got in there. And they took one look at me and said, well, you can't come in here, we're not having him. To which Roger Gordon said, but excuse me, he's number one in the charts, you've got to have him, why not? And they said, we're not having people with hair that length in here. My hair wasn't much longer than it is now, I've got to be honest. But in those days, everybody was short back and sides. I was thrown out of the hotel. Well, Roger, of course, is mortified. There's his number one artist, suddenly chucked out of a hotel. We went round to four more hotels. I was number one in Los Angeles. Every one of them said, we're not having him in there with hair like that. We finally arrived at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And Roger went in and I went in and they said, oh, wonderful to see you. By the time I got up to my lovely suite, because I have duplex suites in the Beverly Wilshire, which I loved... There were these huge baskets of fruit and flowers with congratulations on your number one. Welcome to the hotel. We love everyone's gone to the moon. Well, I've got to tell you, it was then owned by Hernando Courtright. Not anymore. But that personal touch made A, me stay there every time I've ever been to Los Angeles since, and B, persuade everyone else I knew to stay there, which of course included people like Mick Jagger and the Stones and so on, and Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel. And that's another story there, because one day I was sitting by the pool, and I think it was March or April, and it was for Los Angeles, a, a gorgeous sunny day, but quite chilly. For both Paul Simon, a New Yorker, and me, a Londoner, it was sunbathing weather. So the two of us were by the pool on sun lounges, having a chat and a gossip. Everyone else thought we were mad. What were we doing out there? We'd freeze to death. Anyway, um, Paul was due to appear in this festival called the Monterey Pop Festival, and he said to me, Jonathan, I've had this great idea. I think we should do it free. Who do you think I could get in touch with who would help on that? And I said, Paul McCartney, put him in touch with Paul. But I was very nervous about this because my friend Derek Taylor was the publicist for the Monterey Pop Festival. And I thought, if it's free, he's not going to get any money. Anyway, it did become free. And indeed, Derek did get some money. So everything worked out all right in the end. Um, Paul Simon was just one of the many people I used to see when I was in America. Um, all over Los Angeles there were people. I remember having a hamburger with Mama Cass at the Hamburger Hamlet on Sunset that she used to go to all the time. Phil Spector would be in, um, I think there was a deli there. I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but it was a wonderful deli which Phil Spector would always be in and we'd always go in late, late at night in there. Um, the Jefferson Airplane were around because it was the big rebellious time. Um, it was just a great, fantastic time to be a teenager from Britain with a hit in America. Uh, I remember I got very friendly with a lot of radio people. There's a brilliant guy called Bill Drake who programmed all the top stations in America. 
especially one called KHJ. And I was introduced to him, we spent the whole day together, and he told me all about his programming policies and reasons, including 2020 news and things like this, which absolutely fascinated me. And at the end of it all, he took the record I had out, called Round Round, put it on his station, and it became huge on that one station in only in California. It also got picked up by a wonderful man called Bill Gavin, who did a tip sheet. It was never a hit anywhere else, but it was huge in California. Very happy days gone by on KHJ. I used to go out to KRLA that had people like Dick Biondi and Casey Kasem, the DJ. In New York, there was Jack Spector and the WMCA Good Guys. Uh, there was a WABC, which was programmed by a wonderful man called Rick Sklar. I knew them all and had a great time with all of them and appeared on TV. I remember doing Hullabaloo. And I did Everyone's Gone to the Moon, of course. I then had to sing Can You Believe This? You've Lost That Loving Feeling with my silly little voice. And as the climax, we had to dance around. Me, Leslie Gore, remember, it's my party and I cry if I want to. And Ramsey Lewis Trio, we all had to dance around to the biggest hit of the year, which was Wooly Bully. If anyone's got a tape of that Hullabaloo, it could be the most embarrassing appearance on television ever.